uh, I think it's time to start. Uh, and uh, although that uh, there's some guests uh, online need to register uh, in rooms, uh, I think the Tamar we can start, okay? All right, so uh, let me first. Um, distinguished guest, uh, I'm Li Yuxiao, Secretary General of the Cybersecurity Association of China. Welcome to the IGF forum. Uh, this is the IGF workshop. Our workshop is themed uh, a discussion on the protection on personal data slash information and the privacy in the prevention and the control of COVID-19. This event is co-hosted by China Internet Development Foundation. And uh, beside me is uh, Mr. Peng Feng. Uh, he's a uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the China Internet Development Foundation. And also Cybersecurity Association of China, I'm from here. And the China EO, uh, later uh, Mr. Luigi will have a speech. And the uh, Council of Europe, that uh, there are some experts from Europe and also uh, uh, Tamar, you are from the uh, Council of Europe. And uh, I talk of France. Uh, Ms. Tamar uh, Hardeney, first vice chair of the Committee of Convention 108 from Council of Europe, uh, and I will host the workshop together. So uh, I must say uh, thank you all. And with the global spread of the COVID 19, social and economic growth has been greatly affected worldwide. Under this uh, severe situation, we are very glad to meet you here online. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone must uh, feel uh, fit about this uh, situation because that uh, some of you uh, uh, join this uh, uh, conference uh, in your room, uh, in your home. Uh, some of us uh, uh, come here in this uh, uh, hall. Uh, I hope that we can share our ideas uh, directly and uh, uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant your ideas will give us a good uh, chance for the future. So we are uh, talk about the personal data slash information and the privacy uh, security issues with global attention and the uh, term peace. Thank you. Indeed, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has brought tremendous global challenges, many technological solutions applied to stop the spread of the virus, diagnose and provide treatment involve the processing of personal data, including sensitive health data. I firmly believe that the data protection is not yes or no exercise, even in the crisis, it is how to exercise. Therefore, I'm very privileged to co-moderate discussion with such a distinguished speakers and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Yeah, and uh, may I suggest our speaker say hi to everybody. And, uh, maybe wave your hand on screen, okay? Hi. Thank you, thank you all, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, now let's start our workshop. Uh, first, uh, due to the time limit, each speaker please make sure to finish your speech within seven minutes so that uh, late speakers have enough time to share their opinions. And uh, today we're honored to have Mr. Liang Hao here with us. He's uh, sat beside me and uh, he is a Deputy Director General of Bureau of International Cooperation of Cyberspace Administration of China. Now let's welcome Mr. Liang Hao to address. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Li for inviting me here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to join you in this IGF workshop. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to extend on behalf of the Cybersecurity, uh, Cyberspace Administration of China, or CAC, my uh, warm congratulations on the opening of this workshop. As we speak, COVID-19 pandemic is posing severe challenges across the world. It is reshaping how we work, think, and live. So in this context, transitioning toward a global digital economy has rapidly accelerated. 
Information technology has been playing a much critical role in many aspects. For example, epidemic information sharing, supplies, assistance, and telemedicine, etc. Meanwhile, technology-based anti-epidemic efforts, if built or used incorrectly, incur risks to personal information and privacy. China attaches great importance to protection of basic rights and the interests of the people, especially the right to personal information and privacy. We have stepped up domestic legislature, the cybersecurity law, which came into force in 2017, specifies that network operators should set up and optimize protection mechanism of user information. The civil code adopted this May stipulates how to protect privacy and personal information. The draft personal information protection law was submitted to the Standing Committee of National People's Congress for preliminary review in this October. It aims to cement the rights enjoyed by the subjects and further improve relevant legal system. Protecting personal information and privacy is undoubtedly a global issue and no country is immune. The world needs truly global solution. China has put forward the global initiative on data security in this September, calling for collective discussions on measures dealing with data security risks, as well as concerted actions on global digital governance. So I would like to take this opportunity to make the following three points. First, states need to improve domestic legislature and cross-border coordination in a bid to establish multi-tiered personal information protection systems through legislative, administrative, judicial, and other instruments. Governments should put a premium on and conduct in-depth research into emerging issues facing personal information protection in our era of big data. It is imperative to continuously improve domestic legislature to bring it in line with national conditions. Governments also need to adopt a multi-pronged approach in a holistic fashion to step up protection. Our goals are twofold. One is better protection of personal information and privacy. The other is to jointly foster sustainable global data governance. Second, the roles of various actors should be given full play in order to form great synergy. Security of personal information has a direct bearing on everyone, governments, businesses, technical communities, non-governmental institutions, as well as individuals. States need to facilitate cooperation between mm -hmm. public and private sectors, advocate for company self-discipline, and continuously raise public awareness with a view to pulling everyone together for our common cause. Third, we should further deepen international cooperation in cyberspace and continue to exert the significant roles of global dialogues and platforms in setting up rules on data protection. States should, in the spirit of equality, mutual trust, and the win-win cooperation, give full play to the UN's main channel role, leverage IGF, APEC, G20, and the World Internet Conference and other fora for exchanges and cooperation, and facilitate establishing international standards that are in the common interests of international community so as to ensure lawful, orderly, and free flow of data. Ladies and gentlemen, solidarity and cooperation is the only way forward. Let us work together to address the challenges head on and build a community with a shared future in cyberspace. 
I wish this workshop a complete success. Thank you all. Thank you for interesting messages. Um, and um, because time is limited um, and we want all participants to be able to ask questions at the end, um, let me now uh, present with great pleasure our next speaker, Mr. Jan Kleinsen, Director of the Information Society and in Action Against Crime at the Council of Europe. Please, Jan, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tamar, and uh, thank you very much to the IGF team and all participants for your readiness and uh, commitment to meet under these very difficult circumstances uh, on such an important issue as the protection of personal data and the fight against COVID-19. I would like to thank in particular also our partners from China and from France in organizing this, uh, this event, this workshop. I'm very happy to represent the Council of Europe uh, at this meeting, um, an organization made up of 47 European member states, but whose standards uh, have reached far beyond the, the limits of Europe. We are very proud to have elaborated Convention 108, which, is now, uh, which has 55 state parties and some 25 observers. So indeed far more than our 47 member states. Uh, and Convention 108, as most of you will know, remains to this day the only internationally legally binding instrument uh, on data protection, enabling an active engagement uh, from member states all around the world on this important topic and on the challenges that are facing us, even more so in the light of the COVID-19 crisis, of course. In April uh, this year, uh, in order to, prevent, to present our member states with some guidance as to how to address the crisis, uh, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe issued a toolkit, uh, which was called Respecting Democracy, Rule of Law and Human Rights in the Framework of the COVID-19 Sanitary Crisis. And in this toolkit, a number of data protection issues were underlined. Uh, since then, uh, the chair of the committee uh, 108, you know, the convention 108, is uh, looked after, is implemented through uh, notably a committee uh, of, of national experts, uh, the TPD, and it published, uh, has published several uh, statements on how this convention, our convention, can best be used in the context of COVID-19. And the main message is that the general rules and principles of data protection are fully compatible and can be reconciled with other fundamental rights and public interest, notably the right to public health. There is no contradiction between them. Convention 108 is perfectly suited and perfectly enables governments all around the world to address the COVID-19 crisis while respecting the rights to privacy data protection set out in Convention 108. In uh, October, so very recently, beginning of October, 12 October, we issued a report uh, setting out how states are doing that. We showcased best practice uh, developed by some member states, uh, such as the use of privacy impact assessments prior to taking measures to fight COVID-19, uh, privacy by design principles implemented by a number of parties uh, in order to uh, best address the issues relating to the current crisis. And we also highlighted a number of measures uh, that pose problems, such as uh, mandatory use of contact tracing apps or measures which are taking a state of emergency without any time limits. I know there are many speakers after me, so I will refer you here to the uh, summary of the report, and I'm sure the link will be made available, uh, which makes two uh, recommendations with which I would like to finish. And the first is a recommendation that bears in mind that uh, the sanitary crisis uh, will be over at some point, and hopefully it will be over as soon as possible. But the measures taken by governments uh, might last. 
And therefore, it is important to ensure that the exceptional measures taken by governments must be provided by law, must respect human rights and freedoms, and must be necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. And secondly, uh, it is clear that the manner in which this health crisis has to be addressed, needs to be addressed, makes it clear that data protection principles remain fundamental for the effective functioning of democracies. And our capacity to react promptly to the new challenges without undermining our core values and without putting our societies at even greater risk in the future will be the test that we have to meet. So on this basis, I wish you a very successful meeting and uh, look forward to the discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your address, Mr. Kalashin. Now, let's welcome Mr. Peng Feng, Deputy Secretary General of China Internet Development Foundation, which is one of our organizers of this workshop to address us. Distinguished guests, participants online, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. I'm very honored to participate in this uh, forum as an organizer on behalf of China Internet Development Foundation. I'd like to express our warmest welcome to all the participants. Our foundation is a uh, public place and a public purpose social organization from the internet area. And since its inception, we have been focusing on the development of the internet. So we raise uh, public money and uh, uh, rally people's power to promote the development of the internet uh, and uh, uh, cyber security development. Uh, in particular, we are devoted to exchanging cooperation with international partners uh, uh, so that uh, the internet can benefit uh, billions of people in the world. Uh, the onset of COVID-19 has put uh, the world to test. A lot of international meetings have had to be canceled or postponed against such background. Uh, it is gratifying that uh, we can uh, hold this forum on time, and this shows uh, the benefit of promoting the development of the internet and IT technology. We know that with the rapid growth of the internet, while well, we're enjoying the benefits of the internet, we're also suffering the challenge of the internet, especially the leakage of personal data and privacy. Uh, it is now an urgent issue to effectively protect personal data and privacy. In 2019, at China's cybersecurity promotion week, Chinese President Xi Jinping said that uh, cybersecurity is for the people and by the people. It is important that we protect people's uh, information security and the rise and interest of people in cyberspace. And this has provided important guidelines for protecting personal data. How can we improve people's sense of fulfillment, uh, uh, happiness, and the security in cyberspace? China is uh, actively promoting the building of global internet governance system and to build a uh, sh shared community in cyberspace. We have developed Chinese experience and contributed to China, Chinese solutions in recent years, China Development, uh, develop, China Internet uh, Foundation uh, has actively participated in international governance in cyberspace and has the 11th and 14th uh, UNIGF forums. So we hosted uh, workshops uh, last year we hosted uh, China Europe Data Security and Personal Information Protection Workshop to promote international exchange. And this year, COVID-19 has made uh, IT use and personal data protection a focus of the world again. And uh, with uh, the uh, epidemic, uh, China used the internet technology and made the victory over the disease and we are also trying our best to help the rest of the world to show the responsibility of China. As someone participating in the epidemic control, I feel that on the one hand, it is key to uh, leverage uh, 
internet information technology, although COVID-19 has seriously affected our life and the production. However, uh, we see that uh, internet and IT technology has played unique and important roles. For example, distance uh, medical treatment uh, has uh, helped us with uh, prevention control of epidemic. Online supermarket and online classroom have helped with our lifestyle and uh, uh, live stream commerce and e-commerce have helped the economy to recover. So in China, we didn't lose uh, hope and uh, we launched a new way of life and work and study. And on the other hand, it is urgent that we protect the personal data and privacy because we use such apps as uh, Healthy Code. Uh, um, we have been able to support a resumption of work on the production, but at the same time, there is a risk of abuse and leakage of personal information. So data security has become a hot uh, topic. In order to answer people's concerns, the Chinese government has taken a number of measures uh, trying to find a balance between the use of information, and the protection of information, and in the next step, we'll continue to adopt measures to protect personal data and privacy in terms of data technology platform and uh, regulations so that uh, people can be assured. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, now global pandemic, it's still serious. More and more countries and people have realized that uh, we share uh, the same future and uh, in front of the common enemies, we must uh, be united uh, and uh, work hard to overcome the difficult uh, times. The just colluded the fifth uh, plenary session of the 19th CPC Congress uh, made plans for China's 14th five year plan. And uh, we're going to start a new journey of building a socialist modern country. And in this plan, China says that we must accelerate the building of a cyberspace governance system, uh, build a cybersecurity system, and uh, accelerate uh, the protection of personal data and to build a global cooperation uh, in cyberspace. Uh, in the future, our foundation will continue to pay attention to data security, personal information, privacy protection, so that we can uh, better utilize our role as a social organization and to promote uh, the building of international consensus on personal data and uh, privacy protection. And uh, we welcome exchange and cooperation with all relevant institutions uh, so that we can all contribute to global digital development and building of the cyberspace community of shared future. I wish this uh, forum a resounding success. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. This is initial intervention. I'm sure during the Q&A session, we will have a chance to discuss in details. Now let me introduce uh, Dr. Stephanie Perrin, uh, she is president of Digital Discretion, Canadian Privacy and Information Management Consulting Company and chair of non-commercial stakeholders group with extensive experience in data protection. So please, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm actually the former chair, having just passed the chair over to uh, Bruno Santos uh, at, at ICANN. Um, I'd like to give you a personal perspective on some of the work I'm doing pro bono uh, on specific COVID applications. So, and the first one is an example on uh, data limitation. It is not always necessary to use IT for simple applications. So I volunteer as a privacy officer for the Anglican Church of Canada, Diocese of Ottawa. And uh, the municipalities have asked all the churches to uh, enable contact tracing with their congregations just because there have been vectors coming from church attendance, uh, vectors of disease. So we're using a clipboard uh, managed by the greeter at the door. That piece of paper will go with its name, address, and phone numbers into a locked filing cabinet and be destroyed after a month. Uh, that's a pretty easy solution uh, to uh, the data protection issue there. 
My second application is uh, much more complex. This is the COVID tracing app for cell phones, which has been developed by my former colleagues at uh, Industry Canada, now known as ICED. Uh, this uh, is a federal government uh, initiative done jointly with Ontario and is now available for free download across the country. They have uh, had both the federal and the Ontario privacy commissioners review the application. They did a, and that was shared then with provincial uh, privacy commissioners. They did a privacy impact assessment on the application itself. They have taken uh, me measures to uh, obfuscate identity by using random codes and to make sure that the IP address is uh, securely stored out of main traffic. In other words, not on the portal and then destroyed after three months. So that's a security measure that maintains privacy because as we know, IP address can be considered personal information and lead you to the identity of the individual. They have established an advisory council for oversight, and that advisory council includes one of my colleagues from the Canadian Civil Liberties Union, who have been uh, quite critical of the, of the whole concept of uh, using cell phones for COVID tracing because of the implications for broader surveillance. So uh, there has been a PIA done on the portal itself. Uh, it is not available online, but the other materials are available online. And uh, there was a commitment to ongoing review by the privacy commissioners to ensure that the actual uh, data management practices are being followed. So I think this is a pretty good application, a pretty good uh, example of building privacy in at the ground floor. And my lingering concern that I'm sure the privacy commissioners will be watching for is, uh, well, I have two, habituation to phone tracing. Uh, in other words, will this be the start of more phone tracing? And secondarily, they've already raised this issue. This is voluntary. Uh, it may be that employers and uh, entities in the private sector uh, may insist on this, uh, employers uh, looking for uh, employees to be um, tracked. So that's something to keep an eye on, but this would be subject to both the Privacy Act and in the private sector, the uh, PIPADA privacy legislation. So now my next uh, example is indeed quite a bit more complex. Um, I volunteer uh, with Palantir Technologies on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Advisory Council. And this council meets regularly to interrogate the effectiveness of the company's use of privacy by design thinking in developing its products and applications. If you're not familiar with Palantir, uh, they have very powerful um, artificial intelligence technology uh, and uh, software. And they have made their foundry technology available to governments um, most notably the Center for Disease Control in the United States to assist in combating the coronavirus. So um, we have been looking at some of their applications and uh, providing a critique. The council itself is comprised of folks with a career in uh, data protection. So uh, several things have been brought out in, in white papers and in the public information that uh, Palantir has made available on this. The, the first key thing is transparency, accountability, and proportionality in all data use. These are overarching principles of data protection and they're imperative in COVID applications. Citizens are not gonna share data without trust and that will impact the disease spread. So in this data governance is key. Now, um, there, here are a few applications here in terms of outbreak prediction. Supply management, uh, in other words, personal protective equipment, testing materials, um, beds in hospitals, personnel. This is all dependent on timely outbreak prediction and monitoring. The, and there are several uh, risks. The data quality varies in all of these uh, supply chains. Uh, it doesn't require personal data, so data aggregation can be used. And um, there is, of course, always a risk with data aggregation in variant data quality, data re-identification, and uh, lack of sound data governance. Now, I'll speak about sound data governance later. In terms of COVID contact tracing, um, there is a need-to-know principle that needs to be incorporated in the uh, in the actual contact tracing. Not everyone needs to know the personal identity or any of the personal data. 
Um, quarantine monitoring and immunity passports, another application that where uh, data, rich data has been uh, implicated. Um, there are serious risks of civil liberties infringement, uh, racial or socioeconomic profiling, differential enforcement of pandemic extraordinary powers when it comes to uh, quarantine monitoring. Who's being quarantined? For how long? How, how much do we trust them? Those kinds of questions arise. So sound data governance is required here to ensure fairness and equity and uh, no intrusion into civil liberties. Um, except as, of course, required by pandemic legislation, which most countries have in place uh, when they need it. Um, the mitigations for data governance issues, Palantir has uh, listed an overview of technical controls that they consider to be essential for facilitating sound data governance practices. And I do agree with these, and these can be built in in a privacy by design uh, fashion. First is discovery and classification, the ability to find and differentiate between different types of data. Not always present, you'd think it would be, but it isn't. Uh, dynamic data minimization, limiting access to sensitive data, sensitive data, excuse me, based on the legitimate need and purpose of processing. That is present in the law, not always built into the systems that provide access. And uh, uh, that's a critical component. Uh, prompts and notifications, encouraging the appropriate use and accountability of data handling by enforcing additional controls prior to users accessing sensitive data and applications. That's really a subset of the earlier dyna dynamic data minimization. Auditing, facilitating, uh, facilitating oversight by maintaining a comprehensive overview of processing operations. Retention, making data irreversibly irretrievable once its processing purpose has expired. Obviously always in law has been for 50 years, but not always built into systems and not always easy to do in busy organizations. So I would like to note uh, finally here that the effectiveness of data governance controls is largely dependent on the presence of some kind of independent oversight, usually in the form of a data commissioner or an independent oversight body. Now this is difficult to enforce if you're a private, se a private sector company dealing with clients. Uh, this is where uh, data protection authorities are really uh, imperative to have a look in at what's going on. I must say that a, um, a civil liberties oversight uh, uh, board to be seen in Canada in the COVID tracing app, uh, that can also be helpful. So uh, I hope I have remained within my seven minutes. That's just a quick trot through uh, three applications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perrin. Uh, I think uh, your pra uh, practice is very interesting and uh, you, you uh, share us that uh, if we face to the difficulty uh, situations such as uh, when we face to the pandemic, we don't know what is the best way to protect the, the data, our personal uh, privacy. But if we insist to put the personal data, our uh, privacy, ahead, we can try, thank you again. And uh, uh, now let's welcome Mr. Luigi uh, Gambadella, uh, President of China EU, and uh, uh, additional word that China EU is uh, also one of our organizer of this workshop. Luigi, please. Sorry, uh, Luigi, please uh, turn on. We can't hear you. Okay. So thank you very much, dear friends. It's my great pleasure to join you today and to share with you my perspective. First of all, let me start with a very good news just published. In fact, I was looking at my mobile. Five Pfizer, which is one of the biggest pharma industry, uh, announced COVID-19 vaccine is 90% effective. And this is a great news for all of us. And I see this news is already spreading all over the world. So we will follow uh, the next steps. Um, let me start. When the first government lockdowns were announced in Europe in the spring of this year, the debate on how to combine due respect to data privacy 
with the collection of data critical for the management of a public emergency was fast forward. And the debate was catalyzed by the often opposing views on the design and adoption of tracing apps. In several European countries, their introduction was marked by public opposition, fearing that public health objectives were invoked to encroach on individual private rights. And a growing chorus of voices in the media and the social media began questioning safeguards on the protections of the fundamental right to privacy in the rest, in the interest of a for more effective public health response, especially through Mar March, when the case numbers were exploding in Europe, while China seemed to have successfully flattened the curve, there was much more reticence to defend the sanctity of data privacy in the face of such an acute crisis. And sooner or later, the debate would have flared up. What was inevitably going to happen only happened on an accelerated timetable. From an internet governance and data privacy point of view, the outcome of the debate today does not seem, however, very satisfactory. Years of conferences and speeches about the very high bar set by Europe when it comes to data protection have convinced the European citizen that their data belongs to them individually not to their government. And the GDPR and knowledge derogations from these protections must always be strictly required, temporary and proportional. With other words, the burden of proof is put on the health authorities that there is no less intrusive way than the one they propose to protect public health. Therefore, when European governments sought the cooperation of mobile operators to monitor compliance with the lockdown and social distancing measures on a aggregate basis, there was a public opinion backlash in many countries. While initially government envisaged making tracking apps mandatory to better break infection cycles, once they become apparent, the idea was dropped following the initial reaction against mobile operators sharing location data with the public authorities. In addition, apps based on geolocalization become taboo. Vocal internet rights defenders ruled out that European policymakers would be granted the ability to track the geolocation data of millions of citizens. And the main argument was that for governments, having access to the personal data of its citizen may valorize surveillance and coercion at the expenses of persuasion. As a consequence, implementing effectively tracing apps and other IT tools usage to fight the propagation of the virus strengthened. But how could we find a better balance between data privacy and handling in situation of crisis? The issue is not to design an ideal app that the public should sacrifice the protection of their personal data to some higher goods. Specialists and experts may agree on a perfect system. The roots of the problem are not a technical issue, but an issue of trust. Trust building is a patient exercise. Yes, application, implying the processing of personal data, information that have been truly discussed between stakeholders such as civil society, developers, industry, government, data and protection authority will more easily be trusted than government-driven application. But if the government policy to tackle COVID is perceived as incoherent and inconsistent, the European public will lose trust in the capacity of their national government to handle the crisis. And this mistrust will spill over to any application that is promoted. In such circumstances, initiative from NGO backed by the National Data Protection Authority would seem the most appropriate way forward. However, DPAs have in all member states a well-defined portfolio of tasks and can therefore not start in working with NGO on such projects. In a forward-looking perspective, the mandate of the uh, Data Protection Authority should therefore be 
reviewed to enable such cooperation in cases of emergency, even if upstream of the enforcement of the GDPR. An objection against could be that, that if a data protection authority cooperates to the design or tracing up, that it would in the next stage be biased in case of compliance for breaches of the GDPR by this app. My take is that the objection is not valid because in any case, the Data Protection Authority would apply the same criteria to adjudicate complaints that is in, in the, its cooperation upstream. Time is passing, but another governance issue became apparent. How do we get our population online? What use indeed for tracing up if a substantial part of the high risk population above 70 years doesn't use a smartphone or uses it only to talk and read emails? Where this part of the population is online, often stressful circumstances, it appears a very vulnerable target for phishing and other criminal practice. Keeping elderly users safe online is one of the most complex and difficult to other challenges. Some European government engaged with the technical community during this COVID-19 period to find ways to mitigate that danger. However, the success of any policy will depend on the channels available to communicate with the population at risk, which are often very limited given the growing isolation of elderly people in the European member states. My final point relates to the future nature of governance. Until this year, the concept of governance was intimately linked to physical consultation meetings. Interaction in virtual meetings is completely different. Until this year, physical meetings allowed NGO representatives to establish a new relationship and further deepen insight, not the less during coffee breaks or dinner after meeting. There are no new normal in which social interaction are limited and travel is restricted will necessarily have repercussion in the current internet governance model. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as a former data protection commissioner, I, I took many uh, issues um, to me, but I don't have right now to discuss, but I would ask uh, Eduardo Bertoni during the discussion uh, to address several points uh, that Luigi made. I think this will be very important really to address. And now uh, let you. me present our next speaker. Um, this is Ricky Rekish, faculty and researcher on data privacy and protection. Uh, the person was actively engaged in drafting data protection bill of India. So I'm very grateful to have a chance to present uh, Ricky, please, Ricky. Hey, thank you, Tamara. I think I hope I'm audible to everyone. And, and this is a, a warm good evening from India and greetings for everyone across the globe. So uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed, you know, uh, listening to a lot of points which uh, fellows, you know, uh, guests and speaker, they, they brought out. And I think uh, nothing under the sun of privacy was left around. And I think Stephanie covered some important point. I think, uh, you know, Gambrel also, you know, covered a lot of things. Uh, what I really want to uh, draw attention uh, without being, you know, without being politically biased or something uh, from, from privacy world, uh, which will be a problem. Uh, uh, so, so a bit of background, I, I do uh, uh, help a lot of countries in writing their privacy framework. And, and, and from a policy standpoint of view, I'm very active in uh, Middle East. And uh, if, if you look at the whole system right now, uh, the way Middle East and, and the rest of the privacy is very different because uh, unlike other countries, Middle East don't follow a traditional constitutional model, right? So they don't have fundamental rights listed in a piece of document. They don't have a central human right document, which will really be the, the arch pillar for, for borrowing privacy principles, right? Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, if you look at a lot of, lot of other countries, they have a history uh, of, of, you know, uh, of a constitutional remedy available to them and they try to piggyback on the privacy. That's the same thing which happened in India. Uh, you know, the Honorable Supreme Court of India, they passed a justice, they made fundamental right. And then they said, okay, yes, since privacy is a fundamental right, we should mobilize, uh, we should make some additional measures by which we can really help them uh, to, to, you know, to strengthen the, uh, the enforceability of that fundamental right. Or let's say, uh, how does a big IT giant or you know, a, a country like India, which is very dependent on IT, 
will really get into the uh, mode where they can protect themselves from privacy issues. Uh, there are two things which I really want to you know, discuss, as I mentioned. One of them is capacity building. You know, I think in, in a way, everyone touched it. You know, and I think uh, the Honorable Board from China, they also covered on the same point, that if you, no matter a country, small or big, uh, you, have, you will find a lot of challenges when you will try to enforce privacy. Uh, it, will, it is something which is happening in COVID. It will happen you know, when tomorrow something, let's say there'll be x ray or some, some other thing. You know, we, we, can't, we can't really know what's, what's there in the, you know, in the womb of future. But essentially, uh, any, any set of uh, you know, uh, audience uh, as, as big as a country uh, where you have linguistic challenges, you know, Europe is a classical example where you have linguistic challenges. You, know, you, you, you can't really come up with a cookie cutter approach and that will try to solve everything. Uh, India certainly uh, is another example where you have uh, so much of contrast, uh, A, in, in, in literacy level, right? I mean, you, you don't, have, don't have English as the first language for most of them. Uh, you don't have everyone, you know, uh, uh, at, at a basic baseline level of education. You don't have uh, the same level of computer awareness to, to most of your people. Now, if with those kind of challenges, what, what we are seeing right now in India, that uh, uh, the, the most com easy comparable will be security. Uh, security came in almost like 15 years back in the industry. I'm talking about the traditional cyber security, right? When, when, when things really pumped up from, from uh, antivirus to, to really you know, high-end threat system. But if you look at right now, uh, the ecosystem uh, is still struggling to find good professionals who can really give you good advice and who can really help you to, to mitigate privacy issues. Uh, and we are not even talking about the deep down issues of you know AI and you know uh, medical world. We're talking about general privacy issues, and and that's the same thing which is going to happen with this you know uh, the privacy world. Be it China, India, you know uh, anyone who's coming with a new privacy law, how ready they are with, with the with the kind of resources they need to support that law. How much government is really injecting time and money to make sure that you have that you have that mechanism or you have that machinery which will provide you right kind of skills or what right kind of people who can, who can really manage it. That's, that's number one. Number two, uh, in, terms of, in terms of enforceability uh, of, of you know, privacy uh, 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 use cases, you will have to really, you will have to really uh, think about scenarios where, uh, he's my son, you know, he, he, he wants me. So uh, in, terms, in terms of privacy use cases, you'll also have to think uh, that Two, two countries, you know, they can, they can certainly rely on basic para privacy paradigm. But as a researcher, I can tell you that uh, everything, everything across the globe is not same. You cannot, you cannot measure them with the same approach. When GDPR came in, you know, and, and that's a very popular saying in the West when they say, they say that, you know, when GDPR came in, it sucked up all the oxygen of privacy across the globe, right? You know, GDPR was the hot topic. And and, 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 and the way I call it, GDPR is like your naughty cousin in your family. You know, everyone tries to compare them because you know, he went to Harvard, you know, he's well-educated. So now everyone across the globe, they try to compare their privacy thing with GDPR. Well, that's, that's a good thing. You know, if, it, if, it, you know, if you're doing it, you know, from a scholarly, academic, critical point of view, but then you will have to really think about that, you know, Europe has a history of, you know, 50 plus odd years, you know, where they evolved privacy from, you know, from 108 till, till the time it came to GDPR. Not, not many countries will have that privilege. No, not, not many countries will have that kind of history for privacy. Needless to say, not many countries will have that kind of appreciation for privacy because they have other things. They have other issues which are really striking them hard. So the, the, the point which I really want to you know, uh, uh, draw based on researches which we have done that when you try to create a privacy program, when you try to create a privacy establishment, uh, or are you in, in fact the, the kind of regulatory mechanism, uh, the mechanism which you want to erect for the privacy, you have to make sure that try to give your own country or your own you know requirements first preference. Don't don't just baseline things because you know you're reading a fancy white paper you know from from somewhere from you know someone who wrote it in Paris. Uh, things are very different in Paris uh, than you know you compare to Beijing. Things are very different in compared to New Delhi, compared to Dhaka, and and, and the, we have to be very very cognitive about those facts. Capacity building and, and you know uh, comparables and requirement of your own uh, is the only I think is the only way a uh, privacy program will be self sustainable and it will be uh, it will be really something we should work on. Uh, I just want to conclude with the final remark. You know we we completed a recent study and then I think uh, that's the most important thing which which is uh, which is also highlighting a kind of risk which 
many African countries will also face when it comes to privacy. Uh, you will find a similar scenario in Brazil and elsewhere that uh, a country which has other primary issues, I mean, privacy is certainly not one of them, right? Uh, you, you go to India and you go to, you know, a shopping mall. And I, if I say that, hey, uh, you know, Stephanie, you know, uh, give me, give me your family information. I will give you a Zara coupon of 50%. Uh, there's a high chance that, you know, by the day end, you know, I will have a handful amount of data because uh, it, it takes precedence over, over your requirement. Now, in, in that kind of environment, uh, you have to invest, you know, you have to invest really, really high on, on, the, on the education of use cases that uh, often people don't understand that, you know, what will happen, you know, if data goes in the wrong hand. So uh, everyone, everyone has heard about that, you know, that's the, 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 the crude oil contamination in sea that, you know, the people really first try to stop that, okay, yes, the crude oil should not spill in the sea. And once it's there, then the bigger problem is that, okay, now let's see how much harm it can, you know, really do to the marine life, to everyone, and what are the ways by which we can, we can recover it. Uh, unfortunately, there's no right way to recover it, but uh, I think if, we, if you really pace up the privacy program, not according to the globe, but according to your own people, according to your own need, according to your economy, and, and, and the, the way you want to shape your next 20 years, uh, I think privacy will really and slowly and growly. It has to grow organic. You know, that's, that's the whole point. It has to grow organic. You cannot inject it. it you cannot fast pace it because if you try to do it, people will only give you one chance. If they lose it, the game is over. So with that, I think uh, I rest my case. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks to um, uh, Rocky. Uh, I hope your sound is okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, thank you to sharing about a very important uh, uh, thought uh, for the privacy protection divide across the world. I think it exists. And uh, each country must look for the right way to protect the data and uh, uh, the privacy and uh, must fit the, uh, all the principles and uh, rules to fit the uh, people's requirement. And um, now I want to uh, welcome Mr. Fang Yu, Director of Cyber Law Research Center from China Academy of Information and Communication Technology to give his speech. Fine, please. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure and honor to be here with you at this forum. Today, I want to discuss issues about protection of personal data when facing public health crisis. As we all know, big data has played a key role in accurate positioning, analysis, and prediction of COVID-19 which also highlights the contradiction between public interest and individual interest. So I want to discuss how the government can ensure safe and reasonable use of the personal data of relevant people while applying big data in the pandemic. My speech is divided into three parts, including how to protect personal data in the prevention and control of COVID-19 international experience and some thoughts and suggestions. Now let's start with the first part, how to protect personal data in the prevention and control of COVID-19. The priority of public interest is the legal principle to weigh the use and protection of data in the context of conflicts between interests. How to balance it in the prevention and control of pandemic largely depends on the principle of proportionality, that is comparing public needs or interests with the degree of derogation of individual interests to find a relatively reasonable balance. First of all, the use of personal data is based on the premise of affirming the private interest of personal data. Then we can further seek the balance between personal and public interest, which is a proper way to protect and use personal data at the same time. Secondly, only when the protection of personal data endangers public security can personal interest be restricted on the ground of protecting public security. Finally, according to the principle of 
proportionality when it is necessary to infringe another legal interest in order to protect the value of one legal interest. It is prohibited to exceed the extent necessary to achieve this purpose. That is when individual interest gives way to the public interest following that the damage to in individual interest needs to be limited to a reasonable level. The second part deals with the practices of EU and US. According to EU general data protection regulation, it is allowed to process personal data for public interest without the consent of the data subject in order to analyze infectious diseases and make early warning. On March 19th, the European Data Protection Board adopted a statement on the processing of personal data in the context of the COVID-19, pointing out that data protection rules within GDPR do not hinder measures taken in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. However, the data controller and the processor must ensure the protection of personal data. In the US, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 permits the use and disclosure of protected health data without an individual's consent, including public health activities, health oversight activities, health or safety risk reduction, and so on. Finally, I would like to talk about some of my thoughts and suggestions. When emergencies such as epidemics occur, we should follow the principle of reasonableness and compliance, strictly and prudently use personal data, closely focus on the purpose of epidemic prevention and control, and handle the relationship between public interest and individual interest to achieve a balance. First, when personal data is collected and used for the purpose of prevention and control of pandemic, the scope of data controllers can be extended and the principle of informed cons consent can be exempted from laws so as to make the collection of personal data more convenient. The second is to strengthen the security awareness of the data controller or data processor. In the process of personal data collection, if the collection agency adopts the paper field forms to conduct investigations, it needs to be guaranteed that the paper materials are not be photographed or copied. If the relevant data is recorded electronically, it needs to be stored in a specific terminal and encrypted. The third is to clarify the norms for the sharing and use of personal data. Any data that can identify individuals cannot be directly shared and disclosed. And measures such as anonymity should be used in advance. And it is necessary to limit the scope of personal data disclosure. For example, only the gender data, date of diagnosis and activity area of the confirmed patient can be disclosed to satisfy the public's right to know the epidemic data, and it is not necessary to disclose all the detailed personal data of the patient. The fourth is the requirements after public health crisis, the timely, adequate, effective, and proper handling of personal data collected is also an important part of personal data protection when after the epidemic, all parties should destroy or anonymize the storage personal data in time, and the personal data should be subdivided reasonably according to the sensitive sensitivity of personal data. Finally, I would like to say that public health crisis is an important test on the governance ability. The government needs to manage public health crisis according to laws and balance different interest to adopt measures which are appropriate so as to build a personal data protection and a utilization system in emergencies. That's all my sharing and thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, thanks for highlighting important data protection principles. Um, 
we want uh, also audience to be enga as, as engaged as possible. So please use the box uh, for Q and A's. And now let me re um, introduce um, Francesca Musiani, researcher uh, at French National Center for Scientific Research and deputy director of the Center for Internet, Internet and Society. Please, Francesca. Let me switch on. Yeah, so can you hear me? <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, so thanks a lot um, for inviting me to this uh, to this panel. Um, so uh, when it comes to me, so I, I thought I would uh, uh, provide a, a sort of a national perspective on on France and not just um, an institutional one because uh, we have uh, talked a lot about uh, uh, policies uh, and uh, the institutions that. Uh, uh, are working on them, which is very important, uh, but also about uh, the ways in which uh, uh, privacy and data protection related uh, uh, issues when it comes to COVID-19 have been perceived uh, and managed by uh, citizens, because uh, uh, France is a, is a pretty interesting uh, um, example uh, in, in this regard uh, and uh, uh, quite different with respect to other national um, uh, contexts. Uh, so, uh, actually, for a lot of uh, French people, uh, the, the two words COVID-19 and technology ha have also become uh, very closely associated with uh, uh, a third, uh, that is to say a resistance, uh, because uh, ever since um, there has started to be discussions concerning the, the application Stop COVID, for example, uh, there have been uh, several attempts by the French government to deploy digital technologies in order to monitor aspects of the population's activities, their movements, contacts, habits, uh, and uh, uh, this has met with uh, um, a, a fair amount of resistance from uh, citizens and uh, with uh, several warnings coming from uh, agencies tasked with protecting citizen rights that have been worried about uh, the potential of excessive surveillance and uh, the associated uh, privacy risks. Um, so uh, for several months, uh, a central point of debate has been the, the Stop COVID uh, application, which is the contact tracing smartphone app that works in the same way, for example, as the Singapore's Trace Together and Italy's uh, Immuni. Uh, and uh, the Stop COVID project has been controversial since it was first announced in late March. In, and the problem, uh, identified problem, was especially the, the possible threats to privacy. Uh, there were points of uh, debate concerning, for example, whether uh, the app would be able to access and collect individual data uh, or anonymized and aggregated data, thus not directly identifying a person, even though we do know that total anonymization on the internet is known to be very difficult to, to actually achieve. And uh, uh, other issues uh, that were discussed would be, uh, for example, whether eventual follow-up to alerts uh, would be based on voluntary action of the concerned person or from a third party. Uh, so for all these uh, um, debate points, there, there has actually since then been a very limited number of downloads and uh, even less so of notifications uh, sent uh, via the application. Uh, which has led uh, uh, most of the press to view this as a predictable fiasco for the government. And I also wanted to mention uh, another point of controversy, uh, privacy related uh, controversy that is perhaps less known. Uh, it was the, the use of drones uh, by uh, French police to monitor public activity during the pandemic. And actually following a complaint by the French Human Rights League to uh, the France's highest level court, uh, the state council ruled that drones would be banned uh, until a proper legal basis for their deployment was established or until they could be adapted uh, so that individuals filmed uh, by the cameras mounted on the drones could actually not be directly identified. And uh, um, I guess that uh, it is interesting to uh, underline that as with the Stop COVID app, the main question, uh, privacy related and data protection related question here was uh, if specific surveillance uh, and data processing initiatives are authorized in a state of urgency, when and how would the country be able to revert back to the, the rights that citizens enjoyed uh, pre-pandemic? 
and um, perhaps uh, resistance to this uh, uh, data related technology has been particularly vocal in France because uh, it has uh, the pandemic has happened in a particular historical moment when other stuff was happened, uh, including uh, what is arguably a new law uh, for citizens trust in politics. Uh, notably following the, the Yellow Vest's uh, unrest and uh, uh, a long uh, strike among public transport workers. And uh, secondly, perhaps France has also a long history of uh, uh, actors that are very alert uh, to these kind of issues, both in uh, when it comes to NGOs and uh, uh, other civil society organizations. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, French, uh, the French Privacy and Data Protection Commission is uh, uh, well, a very active uh, agency ever since uh, uh, the um, reactions to uh, the Safari project, which was the first large scale attempt by the government to create uh, a centralized database of citizens' personal data uh, has led to its creation uh, now uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, so the CNIL, uh, which is the acronym for uh, the, the French uh, Data Protection Commission, has proved to be a pretty attentive uh, observer uh, of the potential misuses and abuses of digital tools. So it, it was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, almost natural that during the COVID pandemic, uh, it, it was no, uh, no exception. Uh, so where where are we uh, now? Is that uh, the all the, um, uh, the all glances are uh, geared towards uh, the the new version of the Stop COVID uh, application, which is called uh, uh, Tous Anti COVID, uh, and uh, uh, which has been presented in a very interesting uh, manner because uh, it is no longer supposed to be a. a contact tracing app, but uh, one of the many uh, components uh, of uh, the government strategy to, uh, to not only to protect, but also to inform. So it, it is supposed to have an important function of uh, uh, like providing uh, more largely information on the current state of the pandemic and, and on the role of the citizen. So it is part of uh, uh, what the government has repeatedly defined as a responsabilization uh, strategy uh, towards citizens. And at the same time, it, it is obviously meant to to minimize the more surveillance related and the uh, contact tracing related uh, aspects uh, of, um, of the application. Uh, so just to, to conclude, I wanted to, to point to um, two interesting publications that are uh, either have already come out or, or are coming out. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Data Justice uh, and uh, COVID-19 Global Perspectives. I'm putting the link uh, in, the, in the chat. It, it's, uh, it's come out open access uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, at the end of the summer, uh, and uh, it is a very interesting uh, uh, ensemble of uh, reports uh, and uh, uh, transversal comments about uh, uh, how uh, issues of data technologies uh, and COVID-19 have played out in a number of countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I guess that it will be a, a good resource for uh, of interest for several uh, participants to uh, to this panel and uh, for whoever uh, is interested if, and and is a French speaker I don't think it's uh, it's available in English as well uh, here is the uh, the presentation uh, of the of the new uh, contact tracing uh, and the rest uh, application in uh, in France thank you very much and uh, I'm available to take any questions later on <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mosani, uh, for your wonderful speech, and uh, hope that uh, we will read your practice uh, in English version. <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the practice on uh, the metro will be have uh, English version. So now let, let's welcome Ms. Wang, Mr. Wang Lei, Senior Counsel of Xinlang Group, to share his speech. Wang Lei, please. OK, thank you, Professor. Uh, it's my honor to be here to sign my opinions uh, in this forum uh, about the prevention and control of the uh, COVID-19 in digital epidemic prevention. Uh, here is my uh, presentation and uh, there are four parts in my speech. Uh, first one is the, ne the necessity and the particularity of processing personal information in the COVID-19 prevention and the treatment. And the second one is the practice and the digital 
prevention and control in the process of COVID-19 prevention. Uh, and uh, the next is the obligation to protect personal information in the digital. Okay, thank you. Uh, epidemic prevention and control. And uh, the first one is my conclusion. As we know, uh, since the outbreak, uh, since the offer outbreak of new coronavirus infection, uh, digital epidemic prevention and uh, control has provided powerful help for accurate, timely, and uh, comprehensive uh, statistics of personal information during the epidemic period. And uh, he here uh, has the necessity and the particularity of processing personal information. Uh, because the digital epidemic prevention and control has the advantage of being accurate, timely, and comprehensive. And uh, they can uh, process personal information in the process of epidemic prevention and control help us uh, like the technical support for the research and judgment of epidemic situation. Uh, and they can the high efficiency of digital prevention and the control fully uh, demonstrates the necessity of the exploring a new mode of emergency response in the digital area. Uh, this, as we know, the obligation, okay, sorry. Uh, my presentation has passed the, the second part. Uh, the practice of digital prevention and control in the process of COVID prevention. Uh, big data has become a powerful assistant for the epidemic control. At present, it is particularly important to use cloud computing, big data, and uh, other technologies for accurate the, and the detailed data collection and analysis, uh, which can effectively help the government to make scientific decisions. Uh, according to the State Council's uh, notice on scientific and uh, accurate prevention and the control of COVID-19 on February uh, 25th, uh, 2020, the health code is the legal certificate for the administrative organ to comprehensively adjust the, person, the personal health risk level and uh, obtain the qualification to travel and uh, return to work. Here is the uh, obligation to protect personal information in the digital epidemic prevention and control. As we know, how to grasp the scale between the disclosure and the protection and to find the appropriate balance between epidemic uh, prevention and control has become the focus of uh, social concern. And it's true that the epidemic prevention and control needs the collection, uh, utilization, and even a partial disclosure of personal information uh, from government uh, to enterprise, uh, given to individuals, all of them should play an important role about the obligation to protect personal information. Uh, here, uh, government departments collect and publish the information related to the even according to their legal responsibilities and uh, monitor the epidemic situation according to the uh, third A's of the emergency, emergency response law and uh, like the article four second of the regulations on emergency response to public health emergencies and some other uh, regulations. Uh, and enterprise Organizations and individuals undertake the ob obligation of information reporting and uh, use the data to support epidemic prevention and control. Uh, they have three uh, steps. Uh, information, first ones, information directly related 
to the epidemic situation shall be voluntarily reported to the uh, competent authorities and shall not be subject to the personal information protection rules. Uh, the second, data processing in accordance with the requirements or uh, entrusted content shall not exceed the relevant responsibility and the authority of the uh, competent department and shall not be limited by the uh, personal information protection rules and their normal circumstances. And the third, uh, those who independently analyze and utilize user data for the development of products and uh, services related to epidemic prevention and control shall fulfill their obligations of personal information protection under normal circumstances. Uh, the role of Weibo in digital epidemic prevention and control, uh, Weibo uh, as uh, the social, social media platform has set up an anti-COVID-19 Zoom in the social media platform, cooperating with the media, uh, the government uh, medical situations, uh, institutions and the medical staff. Weibo also actively fulfill the main responsibility of enterprises and uh, uh, resolvely deal with the content and the behavior of uh, fabricating and uh, deliberately spreading fake news and uh, reasonable discrimination. Uh, in recent years, uh, China has actively promoted the legislation and the practice of personal information protection. The personal information protection system has been constantly improved and the law enforcement in key areas has been significantly strengthened. Uh, my conclusion, information protection is the proper meaning of the digital economy area and uh, data utilization is a strong driving force for the development of various uh, fields of society. It's necessary to clarify the rules of data utilization in special scenarios such as uh, public events and uh, mm, uh, house emergency events in the form of the rules. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your listening. Uh, thank you for your intervention. Tony, time is running out. So let me present the next speaker, uh, George Maria Tendezwa, um, head of cybercrime prosecution unit uh, in Nigeria. George. Please, floor is yours. Okay. Um, hello. Good day. Um, thank you for. I, I hope um, I hope you can hear me clear. Okay, good. Um, somehow there's some challenge with the video, so we'll we'll leave out the video for now. Um, yes, with respect to. Um, data protection um, and privacy. I'm just going to speak from the perspective of um, law enforcement. Uh, several of the speakers have already outlined um, a lot of the um, a lot of the principles that um, we all agree need. Uh, to be uh, need to be followed. We're basically looking at um, ensuring that um, as we seek to do uh, to counter the epi the pandemic, we also must respect the, um, the 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 privacy rights of individuals. Now, an interesting aspect to this um, for us in in Nigeria has been the how we have had to deal with um, um, how, how we've had to deal with um, personal collection of personal information as it relates also to the upsurge, the rise in online criminal activity. So um, while we have um, we have actively sought to engage 
and respect the uh, privacy of our citizens and residents generally, because this is a constitutional requirement. Um, <clears throat> we have found that it is quite challenging for law enforcement um, to deal with the deluge of uh, mm -hmm. reports and um, complaints that came in in the wake of the pandemic because we saw a sudden rise in um, phishing scams related to the pandemic. Um, there were phishing scams related to government interventions and civil society interventions aimed at um, uh, alleviating some of the challenges posed by the lockdown that was uh, so in the course of that one of the key things we we we, we came we, we had to deal with was how we balance out the need to respect the um, the, the, the principles for data, protect, uh, for data processing, as well as the need for law enforcement to proactively get the requisite information to enable it, differentiate, first of all, between the people that are actually um, uh, patients or people who may be endangered in terms of contact tracing, and then those people that were hiding behind the, um, the situation created by the pandemic to perpetrate crimes. So um, this is uh, one major issue. We, we, we looked within, uh, the, within a legal framework, the National Health Act of 2014, um, which essentially required that um, personal data uh, should be anonymized and all of that. But you know that from a law enforcement perspective, when you anonymize information, it then you're helping the suspect, so to say. It makes it in, it difficult, if not impossible, for law enforcement to get to the perpetrators of some of the uh, online crimes that uh, were taking uh, that were taking place. So this um, is just uh, one major dilemma that um, George, we cannot hear you anymore. Um, one that we've tried to look at what are. Uh, the legal provisions are relating to data protection um, and the needs of law enforcement. Of course, it, it, it is essential to state that at all times, it is one needs to take into cognizance the overriding public interest. And this um, is not just about um, uh, keeping information, uh, keeping the personal information of uh, citizens and residents um, uh, within the bounds, but also making sure that we find that thin line that enables law enforcement to actually carry out their, 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 their work effectively. Um, I, I think by and large, this is um, the angle that I, I want to bring to this, uh, to this discussion. Um, and um, of course, the, the need for uh, even the technical solutions being deployed to find a way of, um, to be deployed in such a way that this balance is maintained. I, I would say that that's the main that, that will be our main uh, point of discussion at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. 
And uh, good thanks to our guest uh, speakers again for your brilliant uh, sharing. So next, uh, we will proceed into the discussion section. And uh, for the time's reason, uh, I hope that uh, everyone can control your time. And first of all, let's uh, invite uh, Ms. Wang Li, researcher at Information Security Law Institute, Xi'an Jiao Tong University, Suzhou Academy to share her ideas. If you have any questions for the guest speaker, feel free to comment at uh, QA areas. We will choose several to discuss. And um, uh, Ms. Wang, please uh, control your time in three minutes. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this uh, chance to join this discussion. And uh, uh, all of your presentation inspired us, and I want to share some of my opinions. In order to mitigate and combat in the threat of pandemic, a government, public, and private organizations have taken se uh, several measures, such as like the imposing social distancing, contact tracing, mandatory teleworking, and med medicine. Meanwhile, we have more consideration that rests on the interplay between privacy and data protection on one hand and the benefit of the public health on the other hand. From my own opinion, uh, I think at least we have at three aspects uh, with four thoughts. One is about, uh, the first one is about uh, develop and use privacy protective technology. Uh, this includes using like the uh, anonymous uh, aggregated data, uh, protecting the word information uh, where they are using a contact tracing app and prevent the data from being shared and used outside the its intended purpose. And we still need to think more about like the uh, AI and other uh, leading technology uh, when, when, we, uh, when they are designed and developed, they should have more consideration about the privacy and the security, uh, not just uh, 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 rather than after their launch. And the second is about, we need to rethink about the common values and the fundamental principles, you know, such as uh, uh, the lawfulness and the trust. Uh, let the public know, the organization, uh, the government and the companies, they will facilitate the regulations and rules with purpose limitation and use limitation. Um, so that the public know they can trust, uh, they can uh, trust uh, the operation of the data processing when their information are uh, collecting, analyzing, using, or sharing. Um, and uh, I think it's um, very uh, important uh, when they when the when it uh, come to the personal uh, identifiable information. Uh, and the third, I think uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's about the uh, data governance cap capability. Um, we need to increase uh, risk awareness, realize the complex of the data governance. We must ensure no, uh, there's no the best way, but, but they just have the suitable and effective ways uh, to combat the, the epidemic. And uh, we do appreciate uh, all the country's contribution and uh, all the experience. Um, still, in the future, we have we need to gather more power and do more cooperation in order to encourage the recovery of the society, so that we can embrace the shared future. Uh, that's that's all, all my uh, opinion. I thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Let me invite Eduardo Bertoni, Argentinian Data Protection Supervisor. Please, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that everybody can hear me well. Um, thanks for the invitation to this workshop and to make my comments. There were all very interesting presentations. Um, I would like to frame my discussion under two specific um, issues. One is that we have to take into account that the main purpose of the workshop is protection of data privacy in the prevention of COVID-19. This is one thing. And the other is that we are speaking at the IGF, which is a multi-stakeholder meeting. So I will mention uh, actions that have been uh, mentioned during the presentation that should be made not only by governments, but I think also by civil society, academia, the technical sector, and so on. So I believe that there were many important outcomes during the debates. I'm not, I cannot uh, mention 
all of them. I just point some of them because I don't have the, the time to do so. One word that I heard uh, in some presentation was the word balance. Balance between uh, data, uh, personal data collection and protection of uh, health. I said many times during these months that there is a false dilemma uh, when we put uh, protection of health versus protection of privacy. Uh, we can protect privacy and we can protect the health of the people during the pandemic at the same time. Uh, the, the, um, the question is how? So we heard some ideas during the discussions. One idea is improve domestic legislation. Improve domestic legislation for data protection and maybe for uh, health uh, protection as well, but this is not my area of expertise. But uh, improving domestic legislation for uh, in, in the realm of data protection, I think that we need to have in, 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 in mind that it should be done by uh, respecting principles that are basic principles for data protections, like the principle of proportionality that was mentioned, transparency, and basically the goal of this change of domestic legislation should be increased trust in the people in accordance or in the, in the directions that their personal data will be protected. Then there was another, another idea that came out to, from the discussion, which is the, important, the, important, the, the, the importance of uh, the coordination of data transfer. And um, basically some of the speakers mentioned the importance of free flow of information, that I agree. Uh, but for doing that, I think, and someone explained that it's important to have some sort of international agreements for coordinations and agreements like the Convention 108 and Convention 108 Plus uh, might be an important tool to take into account for coordination and for uh, establishing strong parameters for data flow. Finally, uh, the role of uh, the DPAs in all of this. Uh, let me tell you what we have been doing during the pandemic. And uh, my main point here is uh, thinking in the future. Uh, what we, we were doing was we were uh, paying attention to, to different apps that were developed particularly with the by the government. Uh, we, we did a lot of recommendations uh, trying to uh, maintain the apps development in a way that respect the international agreements that Argentina is a state party or the domestic legislation. Um, and I think that many DBAs around the world and particularly in my region in Latin America are doing uh, the same. There is uh, also a responsibility of the technical sector to take into account something that was mentioned, uh, which is develop uh, these uh, new technologies or these technologies um, and doing a privacy impact assessment before, before uh, putting into motion those applications and having in mind uh, well-established principles like uh, privacy by default or privacy by design. And finally, uh, I think that for the future, uh, it will be an important uh, work for us as DPAs because uh, we are, uh, during these this months, there was a huge amount of data collection uh, made by government or by the private sector uh, with the goal to fight against the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic at some point will end and all those, all, the, all, that, all that data, all that information uh, should not be used for a different purpose. So it will be in our shoulders to pay attention that the data that have been collected for a specific purpose during the pandemic will not 
be used for different purposes in the future. This Thank will be you. a difficult task, and I, I encourage civil society to also work on that, make the denounce in the future, and help us DPAs to do our job. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Eduardo. Actually, we had a question regarding from the audience regarding the further steps when the pandemic will be over. And I would um, encourage you also to look at the chat. Uh, Stephanie also provided quite uh, important answers to that question. We have one more question from the audience. Maybe somebody would pick this question, how the different parties deal with the different cultures and cultural understandings when cooperating on an international level? Important question. So if somebody wants to pick this question, let me know. Maybe Eduardo, uh, we can share the Council of Europe <laughs> Convention 108 committee experience, but. You can do better than me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I shall speak, but I, 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 I can will, say something. I will use but, this but, moment uh, in my conclusion part. Now, please, uh, Professor uh, No, I, 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 th I, I think Wait. I mentioned Convention 108 uh, because the Convention 108 is not only the convention by itself, but is uh, the, the, the network, if I may say, of data protection authorities and governments when, where we pass resolutions, declarations that are very useful to understand what are the duties that we have as, as states uh, during this the, this pandemic. So I, I encourage people to see Thank the work you. of the committee. Thank you. I will also reflect um, in my... To make one comment on GDP. Sure. Absolutely. Because my, my feeling is that sometimes uh, when people describe a GDPR, also non-European, they limit uh, their consideration to the aspect of protection which is important. But the real aim of GDPR is not only for protection, it's for the circulation of the personal information. It's like, I make this example. I want the motto. If you, if you introduce, uh, when we have introduced, uh, and China is number one in the- Of course, you know this. Sorry, can I speak? Well, you don't need to announce them now. When you take them Sorry for rules of this section. Uh, due to the limit of time, we must uh, stop the discussion here. I'm sorry. Uh, for, um, my dear uh, Tamar, uh, let's uh, into our conclusion section, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you all for your participation. Uh, and uh, I think there, there's an old Chinese saying to think about the gene uh, shall think of the harm. So this year we have witnessed the, the indispensable rules of information and the communication technology into prevention and the control of the pandemic. At the same time, the discussion and concern about how to secure personal data less information and the privacy during data collection and use has inevitably risen. And by holding the, this kind of workshop, we hope to find the way to maintain the balance between the use of ICT and the personal data less information and privacy security, especially during crisis, just as uh, Eduardo and uh, Luigi said. Mm. And uh, the way to unearth the potential multi-stakeholders has um, have and the role of them uh, should play. So through so creating a digital environment that can secure personal data, less information and privacy. So we noticed that uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic, many countries has raised their prevention and the protection levels. This is a good sign. And just now, a lot of countries that get uh, introduced a lot of practice to us. China is constantly accelerating legislation on data security and uh, criminal information protection. 
and improving data security management system and recently has released the global initiative on data security. This means so that China adhere to the principle of embracing multilateralisms, maintaining balance between security and the development and uh, ensure, ensuring fairness and justice. So in the future, I hope that uh, we can try our best to keep our principle of uh, uh, respect of life, respect of uh, our dignity. And in the future, our cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity Association of China will invite all parties here to continue discussion on these topics. Please keep supporting us. And uh, thank you again for your participation. Thank you, uh, Tama. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think um, we all are sure that data will continue to play a critical role in the fight uh, against the virus. And we've heard about some privacy friendly solutions that can strengthen our effort in this battle. At the same time, we all realize that if not managed and regulated properly, then technological measures applied today could have significant chilling effect on our rights tomorrow, including right to privacy enshrined in Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But today's discussion confirmed that we don't need uh, a trade-off between data protection and public health and or safety of our societies. As uh, Jan mentioned, principles and rules set by a landmark instrument Convention 108 and modernized Convention 108 plus are compatible and reconcilable with important public interests. And in the context of COVID-19, the Council of Europe and data protection authorities worldwide emphasize the global relevance uh, of the principles set by the convention, often seen as a commonly agreeable minimum by all in the area of data protection. I hope that today's discussion will inspire other discussions. I would like to thank again all speakers for their valuable contributions and more than seven, 65 participants for joining us. We should continue, of course, dialogue and find efficient ways to overcome the global pandemic and uphold the protection of our privacy at the same time. And in memory of visionary leader, data protection leader Giovanni Putarelli, let me conclude with his quote, Let's make sure that technologies are designed to serve humankind. Thank you once again. Thank you, Tamar. There's uh, 20 more people in Beijing here. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care of y'all. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Bye.